uh, um, welcome everybody to the the uh, first um, seminar of the uh, joint seminar between Arizona and KAUST in, in um, uh, sustainable agriculture in desert environments. And um, I'm uh, I'm on a leave of absence from uh, Arizona, and I, I was a been a professor there for 20 years, and now I'm at KAUST. Been I'm starting my third year, and um, it's a pretty exciting. Uh, place to be and there's lots of opportunities. Um, and I see, I see a lot of opportunities for collaboration and interactions between uh, our two uh, universities. And um, because we have kind of, I would say similar desert environments, uh, we just, you know, um, so there might be chances of uh, collaborative research, collaborative uh, research projects, grants, things like that. And just uh, an exchange of some ideas. And um, so I wanted to really start things off with a, uh, plant two, two uh, distinguished plant breeders. And uh, for me, that uh, a plant breeder is my, I, I feel my pl a plant breeder are, is kind of my, my customer. He's the person that he or she is the person that, that we're working to develop new varieties. New, I mean, new, new technologies, new discoveries that we can translate and hand that off to a breeder to really Get it uh, working and, and get it to production level, and um, you know, take it take it to the next step, take it to really feeding the world. So, um, and fortunately, uh, we have two um, excellent breeders on 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 the talks today. We have Jesse Poland and Duke Pauly and uh, Duke Pauli. And um, so, um, <clears throat> Jesse, um, he got his uh, BS and MS at K State. He doesn't go very far from home. So he's going to be coming to uh, Cows a long way from home. He got his PhD at Cornell with, um, uh, uh, no, yeah, you got your PhD at Cornell with, with uh, Mike Gore. And then uh, after that, you did um, USDA, USDA DA research. Um, you were a USDA scientist for five years at K-State. Uh, and then um, now you're the presently the director of the Wheat Genetics uh, Resource Center um, and director of the uh, Food Innovation Lab for Applied Wheat Genomics. So he's a double director. And um, uh, he's, we, we recently hired him at Cal, so he's gonna be moving from Kansas to uh, Cal uh, this summer in his family. So we're really super excited about that. And there he's going to under, um, start some new research directions in uh, date palm breeding and genetics, um, trying to understand halophyte germplasm uh, characterization and uh, neo-domestication. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to, to Jesse. And um, so it's in your hands, Jesse. Um, can you, I think you can share the screen. Yeah, let me try that. Thanks, Rod. That was nice. Um, not quite as exciting, maybe if you make it up, but it was still, <laughs> still quite factual. Um, let me see if you can see. Can you see and hear everything okay now? Yeah, everything's good. Everything's good, Jesse. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead then. So thanks, everyone. Um, it's really nice to join for this joint seminar. And um, so we're going to, I'm just going to share some of the work we've been doing uh, with the with the high throughput phenotyping and then how we've been getting into this deep learning and using this for trait characterization. So um, let me see how I move forward here. So just to give some context and to give an idea, we work in wheat and you can see this heat map of wheat production acreage around the world. Here in Kansas, right here in the middle of the US uh, is, is uh, wheat country. And we also do a lot of work over here in South Asia, across North India and Pakistan, Bangladesh. And so these are important, important places and just recognizing like Dr. Borlaug um, said in his, in his Peace Prize lecture that, um, that there's this real tight connection between food security and, and, uh, and peace. And so uh, that's an important focus as we think about increasing production, stabilizing production in the face of, of changing climates. And so overall, um, I'm going to move this thing out of the way. Overall, what this looks like is that if you take the increased demand projected for the next few decades, 
that's about 50 to 60 percent. And if we keep growing the current varieties with climate change, we have a expected a 20 percent loss. And so we need about a 2 percent gain per year to meet those projections. And current current rate is around 1 percent. And so basically we need to double the rate and the speed at which we're doing things. And so what this looks like, uh, there's different factors that go into this. This is historical trends here and then projections going up and um, up and down trends right here. You can see that uh, with this, we need to push this up with agronomy and breeding new improved varieties, but of course climate change, new diseases, water scarcity are always pushing down on this. So in the context of plant breeding, this is this iterative cycle uh, where we where we, where we go from crossing, creating new genetic combinations, and then through a really long evaluation process, trying to pick out things that have disease resistance, evaluating for yield and productivity, and finally evaluating for uh, quality. And this evaluation process becomes extremely long and, and expensive, anywhere from um, eight to 10 or 12 years for a wheat variety. And then finally selecting the best and that advances. So each one of these is a breeding cycle when we talk about breeding cycles. And then so genetic gain is basically how much progress is made in this cycle and how long the cycle takes. And so we have a lot of nice quantitative genetic theory uh, behind all of this. So we call this, it's not the breeder's equation, but their favorite equation. And so what this, the factors that go into this then are uh, the genetic gain over time. This is a function of selection intensity and selection accuracy and genetic variance. And then this is divided by uh, the years per cycle. So basically how long that cycle takes. And so what we want to do is we want to increase the intensity. So this is using bigger populations. We want to increase the accuracy and we want to maintain genetic variance while at the same time trying to decrease the number of years uh, that, that, that this cycle takes. So basically making things go faster and more efficient. And so what this looks like then, it's really plant breeding is really just a, a, a numbers game. And so if you, if you take something like the CIMIT International Wheat Breeding Program, for example, they start out with, with bulk populations that number in the millions of plants. And these are through um, single seed descent and inbreeding to about the F5 generation, these go to tens of thousands of small plot tests uh, that are individual half meter sized plots. And then about 10,000 of those go into full size yield testing. So replicated full size yield plots that are on the order of about one meter by three meters in size. And then, then those selected go to advanced yield testing. And so only at that point, are these um, basically recycled and completed that completed that breeding that breeding cycle, and so you can see just as an idea of the scope and the scale of the numbers that are involved in this thing. So what we think about is this breeding cycle, and how and how we're using genomic prediction and then other types of prediction models to uh, basically accelerate this, being able to predict earlier on in this cycle what uh, the superior performing candidate varieties are going to be and then selecting those. So what this looks like is we're getting to this next generation of prediction models and this is where I'll talk about the high throughput phenotyping is we have something here like the in this first model the genotype being used to go and predict the phenotype. Um, in these, in these interesting models here, we start to look at intermediate phenotypes, maybe things like plant number, um, obviously morphological and developmental traits that are, uh, that are then a component of the final phenotype, which is generally uh, the grain yield. And so the question is, how can we look and fill in these intermediate phenotypes? And this is where the high throughput phenotyping uh, comes into play. And so here's kind of the, the central thesis that we use for a lot of our, our research and thinking about this, this high throughput phenotyping, wanting to evaluate crop performance and predict this. We look at these different traits that we're, that we're, that we're tractably trying to get after using the high throughput phenotyping. And I'll talk through some of these traits and how we're, how we're getting at them. And then these all come together in a combined prediction model, ultimately in the case for wheat, 
uh, trying to trying to uh, go for yield prediction. So just an example to start out on some of these. Before we get into that, though, thinking about some important concepts in HTP and the high throughput phenotyping, just to put this into, into the correct context. And so this first one is, this is Dr. Ravi Singh. He's the head breeder at Simmons. So he tells me HTP is really high throughput painting. And so if you're familiar with the breeding process and, and head rows, these are basically small, small rows um, used for early generation selection. The breeders walk through these very quickly, um, going through several thousand a day. And the ones that look good, uh, you put a little, you mark them with some spray paint and then you know which ones to go back and harvest. And so this is obviously uh, very high throughput. It's very rapid. And with a trained eye, it's actually quite effective selection. So this gets us to this next point then that really that the breeder is the benchmark uh, for all of this. And so meaning here that if we're developing what we consider a high throughput phenotyping system, it really has to be at least as fast and effective as the current breeder's eye or the breeder's selections. This next, this next important concept here is that breeders are notoriously good at phenotyping, meaning notorious, meaning like not so um, not so good, but then good, meaning that breeders do an effect, really effective job at selecting um, the, 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 the right height and the right maturity. But a lot of times the, the data recording of, that, of those phenotypes is, is, uh, is, is not so good or non-existent, right? And so a piece of this is actually getting quantitative data for various traits that might be selected but which the breeders don't actually record any data on them. And then the last piece of this is that just recognizing the power of big populations. So this is a scope of, of what this looks like when you put thousands of breeding lines out in the field. Um, but in the, in the context of quantitative genetics and plant breeding, we gain a lot of power from big populations. So being able to look at larger, more extensive populations gives a lot of increased power uh, for gain from, from selection. So those are some important points, and this gets us to think about what is high throughput phenotyping. So I really want to define and give context for this high throughput. It's this, it's this scope of automated data collection, and then it has to be scalable. So we talked about how quickly breeders go through thousands of plots. We need to be doing this for, for tens of thousands of plots. At a, at a second or less per plot. And so, and then the, the other pieces are it really needs to be field based. So putting this into field conditions, being able to do this at the scale of breeding programs. And then these last pieces on just must be able to, we need, we need automated data processing. A lot of times we can collect really extensive data, but then um, it turns out that we spend way more time processing or analyzing data than we actually did collecting it. So in, the, in this scope, what we're really trying to think about is how do we connect this genotype to phenotype. And in, in quantitative genetics, we're usually, we're usually looking at what phenotypes associate with a given genotype. And this then is this, this, you know, this connecting of the, the DNA variants to the transcription and the protein variants and how this impacts the phenotype. In plant breeding, we're primarily concerned though with the genotype, how we can know what variants predict the phenotype and then use this for selection. Um, the last piece though, that in this high throughput phenotyping, we usually try and think about one phenotype that it can actually predict another more difficult or less tractable phenotype. So one great example is just canopy temperature um, is in, 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 the hot, in the hot environments is negatively correlated with wheat grain yield. And so this is a great example of a, a, a trait canopy temperature that's relatively easy to measure, um, doing a very nice job of predicting another one grain yield that's difficult to measure. So this is, I'll start out with just talking about some really straightforward, simple trait measurements uh, for things like vegetation index. And so here you can see, um, this is just the ratio then of the reflectance and absorbance of near infrared, green and red light. And this gives a very nice, simple assessment of a healthy leaf compared to, compared to a dead one. And so we can do this quite effectively with these unmanned aerial systems or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAS, UAV. 
And, and this is just an example. We've been doing a lot of this work across South Asia in these international yield trials. And you can see a picture up here in this kind of reddish color of a false color image of what this um, NDVI looks like. And so we are able to deploy this quite effectively, routinely now using these UAV systems. Um, and so the, the big part, like I mentioned, is that a huge amount of this actually goes into the data processing. And so here's just a real brief overview of, of what the steps look like. Um, in some of these high throughput data sets, but we have ground control points and we have, we have um, geo surveying of the field. Uh, the image acquisition, this is really just about 20 or 30 minutes of a, of a UAV flight. And then this big piece in the middle here is actually the photogrammetry processing. So Kevin, a postdoc and some others in my group have really done a lot of uh, streamlining and pipelining this analysis because otherwise this is the major bottleneck um, in here. And so, and then out of this, we can actually extract out plot level images that contain, um, say, the, the NDVI values. And so this gives a very efficient pipeline for getting um, from UAV data down to a plot level value that can be used for the prediction modeling. So one example from this uh, UAV data then is I can show uh, the measurement of plant height. And so this is actually done from stereo imaging. And so just like you can see depth because you have stereo vision, uh, the same thing with a UAV moving at different positions can actually recreate a stereo image, a digital elevation of the field. And so this is basically ends up giving us estimates of a three-dimensional coordinates and points on the surface. And so from this, we can measure depth. And, and you can see a little three-dimensional three model of a wheat field here at the top. These are just seedlings that are 10 to 20 centimeters tall. And then in the bottom here, you can see a false color image of, of the height of the elevations, basically, of the wheat field. And each one of these blue um, rectangles here being a wheat plot. Uh, you can see the taller ones versus the shorter ones here. And then you can see like the dark red here is a low dip and irrigation channel uh, in that field. So this gives us a very effective way to start measuring things like plant growth, plant height. And uh, just to give an example of, of one of the traits that we've been working after here on the using this um, digital elevation models as assessment of lodging. And so we can do this then by getting an elevation model prior to uh, lodging, um, basically during the plant growth. After a lodging event, this is a heavy rainstorm uh, that, that, that caused a lot of lodging in the wheat field. You can see the change in elevation between the pre and the post event. And then from this, you can actually subtract those differences and get an index of uh, uh, basically how, how much the elevation decreased or basically how much they fell over. And so we've been using this then and we can get a very accurate high throughput assessment of the lodging assessment. And so just to compare this to the visual scoring, so visually you would go out and, and take an assessment of what percentage and how far over the plants have fallen. And so you can see from these top two, this is lodging incidence and lodging severity. And then the bottom ones here are, are two measures from the, from the digital measurements. And you can see those are really well correlated with the lodging incidents. They're on opposite scales, that's why they're negative. Uh, but this then basically gives us a really nice assessment, high throughput way to measure something complicated, complex like lodging. The important part though, that these lodging measures have a correlation to yield. And so here again, as we think back to that thesis, this is one of those pieces uh, that we're putting together to explain the various uh, components that go into, go into yield. So that's just some examples of how we're measuring a few traits. I talked here about the vegetation index, plant height, um, lodging or some things that we can basically extract out directly from the UAV imaging. And so the, the next piece of the talk here then is just thinking about how do we move beyond sensor measurements to some of these more complex traits, plant morphology, developmental traits that, are, that, that we can't directly measure from the images. And so just to give an idea of what, 
what this looks like or what this means then. If we were phenotyping something like flower color, I like to use this example, showing that from an image, we could just very easily apply a red pixel filter and then count the number of red pixels and say, yes, this one on the right here, this is a red flower. This other one is not a red flower. And so, however, if we want to do something more complicated and say, what type of flower is this? It's actually a really complicated function, even though you can, you can do this very easily from experience and looking at the images. And so from this, from this picture, you take into the account the rotation, the size, the shape, the edges, the color, all of this together. And then you can say, oh, this is a lily, this is a petunia, and identify what kind of flower that is. But these are not direct functions on the, on the image values. And so this is where we get into these convolutional neural networks. Um, and so, and so the key is here that the relationship we want to learn is sufficiently complicated, right? So it's not a direct mapping of, of pixels to a value. And so we use the deep learning approaches. And these, these, these um, convolutional layers go from taking the image values that have a, a, a structured and data through these convolutions until we can, in the last layers, map them onto a category or map them onto a linear, um, uh, linear scale. And so the real key part for this, though, is we have to have huge imaging data sets. And so to put this together, we spend a lot of time actually working on these different vehicles, working on imaging systems. And so this is an example of our feed field imaging vehicle here. It's got a kind of a sunshade canopy here, an array of cameras underneath this, and then two RTK GPS that are precision GPS. And those are taking about two pictures per second per camera. And each one of those images is tagged with a GPS point which enables us to go back and put those um, images and assign them to an individual field plot. And so we did this on a number of different trials um, on, our, on, our, on our wheat trials. These are, these are imaging, the, the field season goes from, from about March and through June, July. And we had a diversity panel. This is an association panel that had about 300 and some entries. And then we also had a biparental mapping population that we did all of these imaging on. So what comes out of this is a data set then is from the whole uh, multiple time points across the season, each of those images assigned to an individual field plot. And then the real key is that we can go through these field plots and take visual assessments. And then that visual measure or whatever we measure on that field plot, those values can be assigned to all of the images that came from that field plot. And now, now, we, now we have the critical thing that's needed for deep learning is we have a, a labeled image data set. And so we call that a breeder trained data set because we're using the breeder scores uh, to label the images. So for training the data set, what goes into this is thousands, hundreds of thousands of images uh, and the breeder labels. And then we use a weighted classification. So these images are classified to percentage for, uh, we did a percentage heading for, for maturity. And then we also did this on onless trait that I'll show you. And so then those are penalized um, in the deep learning for how closely they are to the actual training set. Okay, great. So here's just an example. This is on versus onless. This is um, this is like actually very simple genetically and phenotypically very simple to score, but it's actually a complex trait when we try to do this with deep learning. So you can see an example here, the onless types and then the on wheat types have these little beards or these ons uh, coming out of the out of the out of the wheat spike, and so we use this as really a test case to see if we could apply these deep learning approaches. So the training set then is there's about 700 plots in this diversity panel. Um, we used a set of 600 of them uh, that were on and 24 that were onless as a training set, and then remember we have actually multiple images from each one of those plots. So we start out with thousands of images for these on and onless uh, plots. And then those were sampled for a validation set. And then for a testing set, uh, we actually used uh, a different field season. And so you can see the confusion matrices for the training, the validation, and the testing set here. And we're actually getting very, very good predictions on these. So what this looks like is when we take this to predict that phenotype, 
we can predict each individual image. And so that's what's showing here is the zero or one is for on versus onless on the prediction level versus the observed on the on the um, on the testing set. And you can see at an image level, we have um, very, very high accuracy. And then also the other point is that because we have multiple images from each field plot, we can take a consensus of those images to get a value for the genetic entity that's in that field plot. And so that's what's shown here on the right. You can see that from this, we actually have increased accuracy. And there was only two field plots that were incorrectly um, classified. And that actually turned out to be two replications of this same variety, which interestingly was actually like an intermediate on, kind of a short on type that the visually we scored it as onless and the, the network disagreed and called it an on type. And so we actually had extremely high consistency between the visual and the, and the predicted ones. So now to go on to a little bit more complicated, more interesting trait is we look at uh, these growth stages. And so an important stage for any, any breeding trials is relative maturity. Or in this case for wheat, we, it's measured by heading date. And so for wheat, this is scored as when 50% of the tillers have headed out of the boot. And so this is actually an extremely complicated phenotype if you think about it, because visually to assess this, you'd have to take a mental estimate of how many tillers are in that plot and then how many of them have already headed out. And so it's an important physiological trait, but it's, it's very complicated when we try and do this with something like um, high throughput phenotyping. And so this is where we put the deep learning. So this is an idea of, of just beginning to head. You can see a few of the wheat heads uh, coming out of the boot or coming out, coming out and emerging here. And then something that's uh, 90 or 100% headed here on the right you can see the different development. So we have a huge number of images that look like this. And then each one of these are a time series and they're classified as you know, somewhere between zero, 10, 60, 90, or hundred percent a heading. And so now we're training the network to classify each of those images based on what percentage heading it has. And so the, the training set then becomes these biparental and association panels. And we have uh, several thousand images, but then um, when we combine those, we have tens of thousands of images and then um, patches from those images. And then the validation set is a separate set of 100 plots. And then we test this onto a different year, a different um, uh, trial altogether. So you can see here on the on the right of the confusion matrices um, with the basically the frequency of correctly predicted versus observed on the training, the validation and the testing set. And you can see we're getting a nice linear response between what the network is predicting and what the labels were. So to change this into a percentage heading into an actual date, we can apply some growth curves or fit a logistic regression onto these observations. So this example here, we fit just a standard logistic regression. We fix it, the final value at 100% for heading. And then we can fit this uh, growth curve here and actually identify the point at which it crosses the 50% threshold and assign that as a, as a date or a relative maturity um, for, the, for the heading. And so we can do this then, this can becomes completely automated we can use the network to score each one of the time points in each of the field plots and then apply this regression to identify the heading date. And so that's just an example of what we've done here. Uh, these circles here uh, show, <clears throat> excuse me, these circles here show the visual assessment time points and the percentage scored. And then these blue squares show imaging time points and the uh, the percentage heading that was estimated by the neural network. And so you can see that both of these growth curves fit over top of each other for this individual field plot. Both of these growth curves fit over top of each other very nicely. And so for this individual field plot, we can score that at about 117 days heading. And then we can apply this same logistic regression individually for each one of the field plots. And so when we put that all together, that's what we come up with here. This is showing the estimated heading date 
uh, for all of the thousand field plots that were in this field trial. And each one of these points then represents the measured heading date, estimated heading date between the neural network and the visual scoring. And so you can see here, we have a very nice linear trend across the growing season. Uh, most of these estimates were within one day of each other and very accurate uh, time points. And then we can apply this also for genetic mapping. So we took these values estimated by the, by the neural networks. Uh, we were able to effectively map uh, both known PPD1 and B1. These are photo period sensitive genes that have a big impact on heading and also map shown here is mapping some in epistatic interactions uh, between those in these, in these populations. So interestingly, though, we were able to also come up with new phenotypes because we're looking at the at at these time series. We can actually look at how quickly uh, the these these field plots progress through heading. And so I'm just showing here some examples of 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 field plots that were heading at about the same point at one or two days within each other. But you can see on these top ones how they how they more rapidly progress through these stages of heading. And these bottom ones, how they're much more slowly. And so this is actually the rate of heading. It had a decent heritability, 0.5 to 0.6, and it, it had an interesting and negative correlation to the actual heading date. And so it's interesting, these high throughput phenotyping approaches enable us to come, come out with some, some actually some new uh, previous traits that we had never looked at before. So now I'm just going to finish off the talk and talking about some new technologies, some new approaches um, that, that we're going to say like actually become high throughput. And so with, with this phenotyping tractor, it's like sort of high throughput, but it's, it's not exceptionally fast in the sense of it still takes us several hours to go through a thousand field plots. Um, in contrast now, we're really focused on UAV technology and doing some high resolution imaging with the UAV. And with this, we can go through a thousand field plots in less than uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And so this becomes then like multiple plots per second and really scalable. And so what this looks like then, uh, let me see if this will play here. Oh, wait, they didn't play together. Uh, so basically you can see the UAV moving across the field we use um, an RTK GPS, which is a centimeter level precision. And this UAV is equipped with a 4K um, uh, video camera here with, a, with basically a telephoto lens. And so you can see in this little thumbnail up here, the actual video feed as it moves directly across the field plots. And so we will fly this up and down each individual range in the field. And from that, we can actually capture extremely high resolution videos that can be extracted to high resolution image frames, which give us the same resolution as we were getting on the ground vehicle. So one of the real keys to this, oh, how do I go forward here? One of the real keys to this then is, is actually being able to process and extract out these individual image frames. And so this is where Kevin and my group has done a really nice job using this bandpass filter here to identify each time that the video frames progress from one field plot to another. And then from that to identify the individual video frame that's directly in the center of that field plot and extract that out as, as an image. And so what you can see here then is um, a final image that's been extracted out from that field plot. And you can see we have sub millimeter level image resolution from that UAV that's moving quite quickly over the field. So from that, this is just a zoom in to give you an idea of the kind of resolution that we can get from actually one of those videos. And now we, act, we have a very high throughput platform that can give us the video resolution, that can give us the image resolution to be able to tractably um, go after some of these deep learning approaches using that data. And so we put these same video extracted images through and get the same 99% level image accuracy from the network um, predicting on these images. 
So now we kind of come all this together, we can measure multiple field plots per second. And then we have this existential question that we like, do we still need, do we still need breeders if we have such awesome high throughput phenotyping stuff? Okay, so I'll take a few minutes to, to think about this question. Um, so so the, the amazing part is just the power of this artificial intelligence um, and how it's even surpassing human performance. And so some interesting stuff coming out of like cancer detection and cancer screening. Um, you can see first that, that these neural networks, they're trained using like hundreds of thousands of images. This is like orders of magnitude beyond what like any individual doctor, any individual human uh, could measure. And then you see like things like they're surpassing the human experts in, in cancer uh, prediction, cancer detection. This network says it's achieved performance on par with all tested experts. So in a lot of ways, we can build really robust um, deep learning artificial neural networks that can go through image data sets and do as well or even better and obviously much faster than we can um, visually or manually do this. And so this is from a great perspective from the medical literature talking about, okay, with this smart medicine and these neural networks giving diagnosis, what does this really look like? And so do, you know, do we still need doctors kind of thing? And so they had a nice comparison of looking and comparing this with these autonomous driving vehicles, which are really the forefront of, of AI and going anyway from no automation, the way that we just normally drive the car all the way up to like a full automation where it just runs itself. You can't even override it if you wanted to. And so obviously that's like not a good solution for driving or for like healthcare. And I'll argue maybe that's not a good idea for breeding either. And then in the middle here, we have this basically where, you know, where the AI and the, the, the vehicle is taking in data and then basically being able to, basically being able to um, account for things that the driver would not be able to see, right? And then some conditional to high automation. And so I think, you know, this is where, you know, these, these phases two and three, these are kind of where the self-driving cars are falling into. And I think this is where a lot of the healthcare, and then I'd argue where a lot of the breeding uh, will fall into also. Uh, to this point where we, we can use the deep learning, we can use the AI to really augment and bring in levels of data observation that would be inaccessible or intractable um, to the breeder otherwise, and then basically have a, a huge augmentation, some automation of, of basically the breeding process and more importantly, selection decisions. So the key, though, is, you know, one key that they kind of concluded from this is that there's, you know, the risk of a bad algorithm that's going to be applied across millions of patients, or in this case, millions of selection decisions in the breeding program, that has a much higher risk than if you just make one bad decision as one single doctor. But, however, there's there still is this huge uh, reward for, you know, potential for reducing errors, inefficiencies, and, and cost savings. And that's the same in the, in the breeding program. So just to kind of put everything in perspective as, as a fun conclusion here, I, I took this same problem and tested it on a real neural network, okay? And so this, uh, this was using a, a real network of that, that was two years and 11 months old. And we had one training epic that was that was all the attention span we had for about two minutes. Um, and then we had 16 samples. So we didn't even need a large training data set. And eight of those were on wheat types and eight of them were onless. And for simplicity, um, just like we had to code them for the neural network, we coded them as spiky, which was on and not spiky, uh, which was onless. And then um, we found out that this neural network actually performed extremely well. So let me show you this video of my daughter uh, from a few years ago. Hopefully the sound will come through. This one. Yes. And this one. Yeah. No. And this. Okay, good. She's so cute. We have to watch it again. This one. Yes. And this one. Yeah. No. 
So you can see here that um, we basically have a two-year-old who um, can, in, in, in like just a few seconds, basically do everything that we trained this really fancy neural network uh, to do. And so this gets it in perspective of just where we're at. We're really exciting frontiers, but also uh, just at the very beginning for, for uh, using what is truly artificial intelligence. So just some conclusions from all of this. That the, the HTP is really exciting. It's getting into production mode. It's really integrated to prediction and modeling. Um, and that's, I think that's where it's exciting. Now that we have these data sets, how can we really use them? Uh, the next big thing is that we can really use the deep learning to measure these complex traits, traits that were previously intractable. And then breeders are still very relevant. Like I said, from, you know, taking cues from the medical community, it's going to be this hybrid where it's data augmentation, you know, helping to make decisions. And then, of course, you know, why do it the easy way when the hard way is so much harder? Uh, something that my, you know, my two-year-old daughter could do. We spent like mass amount of time banking this complicated imaging platform and, you know, burning a lot of CPU hours. And so we have to keep in perspective where to really put the effort in, in, in all of this. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of thanks. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, just great people in my group. I highlighted a lot of work from, from Yu Wang, Kevin in my group. Also, Daljeet, some of his work, Mark and Byron have been really critical. And this work was really greatly supported by NSF and then also uh, NIFA and USAID. So I'll stop there and say thanks and um, take any questions now, Rod, or? Um, yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think we're, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna hold the questions to the end, Jesse. Oh. And uh, I think we'll have Duke come in. So I think the idea was to have more of a little bit shorter talk. <laughs> oh no! But uh, it's okay. We'll let we'll let you slide because uh, of your your daughter uh, uh, stole the show. Okay. So. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Ron. No, it's okay. We're we're good. We're good. Jesse's um, second interview talk, right, Jesse? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Yep, yeah, we'll, we'll save the questions to the end just because we want to have a discussion between everybody. I think that that'd be good. So, um, the, uh, the, the next speaker is uh, uh, Duke Pauly. Uh, Paul Lai. I'm sorry, Duke. I always mess up. And uh, I think I actually knew Duke, know Duke a little better than Jesse because I was on the search committee that uh, brought uh, Duke to uh, Arizona. And uh, we needed a, a breeder desperately. And uh, he joined uh, Arizona, in, I think in 2018, he got his PhD and, and, and BS at uh, Montana State. Um, and uh, then he did a postdoc at Cornell. And this one was with Mike Gore. I made a mistake with, with um, Jesse and uh, has been an assistant professor at Arizona since 2018. And one thing, um, and this is along with Jesse the same way. I mean, these two guys are modern plant breeders, all right? And if you look at Jesse's website, I mean, at Duke's website, he, of course, has, he has a couple PhD students, a couple postdocs. He has a research specialist, a, um, a senior engineer, and an electrical engineer, and a research data specialist. So that's what you need in this, you know, in this era. It's not just looking at uh, just doing crosses. You actually need data scientists, which is um, uh, it's, it's it's extremely exciting. And, and at the Center for Desert Agriculture, we're we're hiring a, an ag engineer as we speak. And um, anyway, Duke, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. But he's assembled this whole team in just a few years, and uh, and we'd like to hear from Duke now, Duke. Sure, thank you, Rob, for the introduction. Um, one thing to clarify, I guess, is I would not consider myself a breeder, but I thanks, Rod. I'm sure guys like Jesse are rolling over in their grave. Um, I, I was inspired to be one, but having ended up in Arizona, it didn't quite pan out. Um, you know, okay. Jesse's the real deal, I'm not. Um, but today I wanted to talk about um, basically a research tool that we have in Arizona that's pretty unique, uh, the field gantry. 
um, which is largely what I'll be talking about today in terms of what it took to get it going, um, the work that we're doing with it now, and kind of how we see it going in the future. Um, and so Jesse gave an excellent seminar in terms of like explaining hybrid phenotyping, kind of the concepts, principles, and how it's applied in real breeding applications. And more of what I'll talk about today is kind of like the far end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, what happens when you go overboard kind of. And um, before I begin that, I just kind of the same thing that Jesse pointed out. This is NASA's uh, predicted global surface temperature in the year 2100. Um, don't really need a legend. Basically, everywhere we grow crops is not looking too good in terms of being hot and dry. Um, and so that kind of frames the whole discussion and how I've set up my lab and the research. Um, but before I begin, I would like to thank uh, my entire team as well, Eric Lyons and his group. Um, this has been a huge project. Um, it's taken years, over half a decade. Uh, I got to come in at an opportune time, but um, it really takes a whole village. Everybody else on this slide does all the real work. I just get to tell you about what they do. Um, and so to kind of set the stage larger, you know, water is our most valuable resource. Um, you know, no, no surprise that agricultural production is threatened by variable weather patterns, you know, limited water resources, the fresh water that is available, it's, you know, fierce competition to get access to it. Um, in Arizona, we are now facing a 30% reduction in our allocation of Colorado River water, which will have a drastic impact on our entire state as well as agriculture. Um, globally, you know, same trend that more areas will become arid or semi-arid um, in the next 50 years. So again, creating more pressure on the systems that we already have in place. And so we're faced with this major challenge of, you know, how do we feed humanity, you know, nutritious calories without totally destroying our environment? And understanding that there's a, you know, economic as well as a personal toll. This farm that just lost his cotton field in a drought of 2011. Um, you know, globally, we said farming is starting to have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession, which is, you know, kind of dark, but at the same time, um, highlights the idea of like why this is such a challenge um, going forward. Um, so to take a step back um, as a plant breeder, Jesse can appreciate this. I'll give you my spin on it. Um, plant breeding is a solution to addressing this problem as he highlighted. Um, luckily, I even have a wheat plant in the picture, Jesse. Um, but the drought phenotype is a whole plant response. Um, you know, it's a phenotype that's entirely reliant on the environment in which it's expressed. Um, although some major companies have touted like single gene, you know, drought genes and whatnot, um, you know, we haven't really seen that pan out too much. Um, Aquamax, does have some good performance, but it also, you know, has some downsides too as well in terms of commercial corn variety. And this isn't surprising when we think about the complexities of, you know, whole plant performance. So a plant has to use multiple mechanisms to mitigate stress that it encounters. So this can be through things like leaf morphology, uh, photoprotection such as waxes that coat the leaves, uh, as well as the pigments within the leaf tissue. Um, transpiration efficiency, so how plants are moving water throughout the entire um, xylem structure of the plant itself in relation to stomatal conductance and its ability to fix CO2 to produce biomass. Um, there's components such as water uptake, so roots exploring the ground to capture groundwater resources, as well as like how fast it can extract that water from the soil profile. Um, and finally, there's the age old question of harvest, you know, partitioning the harvest index. Um, so a plant has to make a critical decision of where do I put my carbon towards reproduction or towards vegetative biomass? And so when we think about these concepts, that's kind of why it becomes clear that, you know, improvement must be at the whole plant level. Um, and really, you know, understanding the biology and genetics of stress responsive traits is kind of the ultimate goal that we're looking at. And so really to do this, it's integrating physiology and genetics in context of an environment in which we can do this to really understand the complexities. And as Jesse pointed out, we're kind of at this pivotal time of connecting genotype to phenotype. Um, you know, initially when sequencing was brought online, that was the big rage. Um, you know, and realistically, genotype data is binary data. Um, instead of zeros and ones, it's A's, T's, C's, and G's, and it largely resides over here in a two-dimensional space. Um, but as it goes through internal and external interactions with the environment, um, including its own environment internally, um, that manifests into, you know, fitness landscapes. So basically on the right-hand side, we can see that genes and combinations of genes give rise to different phenotypes based on the environment in which they're expressed. 
And so understanding these complexities is really kind of the forefront of, I think, what most people will consider. And I know certainly NSF, the grand challenge is facing um, some areas of plant science. And so what we're kind of thinking about and what our group is trying to understand is like, how do we really connect the genotype to phenotype gap in the context of heat and drought stress tolerance? And so one way that we have is using this giant tool um, that we call the UA Field Scanalyzer. Um, so this is the world's largest agricultural robot that we know of. Um, basically, it's a 30-ton robot that rides up and down these rails covering about two acres of field space. Um, it operates around the clock autonomously. That box in the middle there that has the glowing red light um, is what houses all the sensors. You can see it's adjustable on three axes. And that's what permits us to scan these crops around the clock and, you know, as well as different varieties of crops. Um, you know, and so my group primarily is responsible for the operation and the actual um, experiments that are conducted underneath of it. Uh, but it's really a large team effort in terms of people at the Danforth Center, Todd Mockler, Andrew Eveland, as well as George Washington University, St. Louis. Um, and so there's a lot of people involved to make all this possible. So one question we commonly get is why Arizona for this? Um, no secret that Arizona is not exactly an agricultural powerhouse state such as like Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, or Indiana. Um, you know, even though our leafy green production and you know, Yuma feeds North America for seven months out of the year, um, we're kind of minor in the terms of the agricultural space. Um, but really what makes us special is our environment. Um, so when I moved here, a lot of my friends and colleagues were kind of like pretty relentless on giving me a hard time about for someone that works in agriculture, why you would go to Arizona. And so when I came here, I kind of had to come up with a nice defensive strategy when I came up with this tagline of Arizona, the climate of tomorrow today. And that's absolutely true. Um, the issues that we are facing in Arizona in terms of, you know, water reductions, um, environmental changes in terms of hot, drier future, really is what's predicted for you know, a lot of the growing environments as we look um, down the road in 50 years. So additionally, um, we're, this is a great location for doing heat and drought stress studies. Um, we have minimal cloud cover. We have consistently high temperatures, uh, minimal precipitation. Last year during the cropping season, we got 2.5 millimeters of rain for the entire season. Um, additionally, we have very high Vapor pressure deficits, this is the actual atmospheric force pulling water out of the plants. Um, this is really what plants are responding to, not just like the heat. Um, and so really it creates an ideal environment for doing this type of research. Um, additionally, this photo is of the Casa Grande National Ruins. Um, this is 30 miles away from our research farm. And this is just kind of like looking back at our history that the indigenous people that were here before us had this large complex canal system um, thriving agricultural industry, if you will, and then suddenly it collapsed, uh, most likely thought about, brought about by climate change. And so it's just kind of funny that, you know, 500 years later, we appear to be in the exact same spot. Um, and so that's kind of why, you know, a nice parallel between having, you know, state-of-the-art infrastructure to study heat and drought stress response um, next to something so historical. Um, so the advantages of the scanalyzer. Um, so we can capture high resolution phenotypes at scale. Um, this is important because of large, these large uh, phenotyping installations are like in growth chambers or large greenhouses. Um, there's a miniature gantry inside a large greenhouse in Cranfield. Um, and so basically what this allows us to do is to take all this sensor and instrumentation outside in the field to see how plants respond to um, real environmental constraints. Um, oops. And so, you know, Jesse talked about high resolution images from UAVs and he's absolutely right. The RGB camera technology is getting impressive. Um, we have several of them. Um, however, what the gantry can produce is really unmatched. Uh, we're talking about 0 0.01 millimeter resolution in our RGB images. Um, you know, if we look at our hyperspectral cameras, our thermal imaging cameras, um, again, we have this really high level of data. The other thing that's really important is that we have all these sensors integrated into one platform. So we can capture you know, multiple plant development and responses to environmental fluctuations in a similar time frame. Um, additionally, you know, Jesse kind of highlighted minimized subjectivity, um, sensor data versus human collected. Um, 
you know, when it's 110 degrees out, people generally aren't super concerned about, you know, collecting the most precise data, especially when they're an undergraduate or somebody that's not paid six figures to be outside in the sun to collect the information. And so this is kind of one of the advantages of the gantry is that we're able to generate highly resolved spatial temporal data sets that we can use for doing things like Jesse highlighted in his seminar. So what's actually on board? Um, so in that white box is we have a 3D line scanner, which creates a um, 3D image. Well, we have a thermal camera, we have a fluorescence camera, um, as well as hyperspectral. And on the bottom of the slide, you can kind of see the data products that are generated. Uh, so on the left hand, we have our standard RGB, um, our thermal image, our fluorescence, 3D is this false color image of baby lettuce plants, and then a hyperspectral image of some sorghum. Um, I apologize, the RGB image is not looking as high res as we'd like. Um, but overall, the gantry is capable of generating about 10 terabytes of data per day. Um, we don't often do this because it's such a huge amount of data. Our typical performance is about 1.5 terabytes per day. And if we think about that scale um, over the course of like, you know, a season, um, you know, we're averaging up to 350 terabytes of data per growing season. And that created initial, you know, a very large problem for our project in the beginning. Um, the first four years of this project, you know, the data was getting shipped somewhere else. It was taking months to analyze. Um, it was really just an issue because we weren't able to like collect the data and see how the system was performing. Um, so recently we had Eric Lines join the team um, and that has just made everything so much better. Um, Eric's like a data slash computational angel sent from the heavens. Super remarkable guy to work with, um, and he has been leading the charge on developing this open source scalable pipeline that we call Fido Oracle. Um, I don't really want to talk a lot about it because this is more Eric's thing, and I would probably not do it justice. But the overall gist of it is that when the field is scanned, the data is sent to Cybers, um, which is a large NSF funded supercomputing cyber infrastructure. Um, so the data is stored, sent to a manager node, and then Basically, using WorkQ, uh, the tasks are automated and sent out to worker nodes. And each worker node's processing is one piece of the larger data set. The result, results are compiled and sent back. And why this is so critical is, again, when we first started, data processing took months. Um, and to give you a full idea, like processing a full day of data now, like on a lab computer, would take 11 years. Uh, with four, five Oracle, we're down to 1.2 days. Um, additionally, uh, the team's made a lot of progress in terms of now automating that. So now you get a handy little Slack message um, when the data has been processed and is ready for you to view. And so this has been really a large shift um, for our group because it's really allowed us to start looking at the data uh, in a real-time basis. And now as we go into our fifth season, um, we finally have the ability for like real-time processing. Um, so this pipeline is, is open, it's free if anybody would like to use it, because as Jesse pointed out, like analyzing, making these pipelines high throughput is really what's critical in terms of leveraging phenomics data um, for more people. Additionally, we realize that not everybody has a gantry. Um, so this whole pipeline works with UAV data. Uh, we're trying it with other types of data, but for the most part, yes, it works on what other people are collecting in their research programs. So now that we have all this data collected, um, the next challenge was, you know, doing some basic things like Jesse mentioned, um, creating ortho mosaics. Um, to people's surprise, the gantry has some unique features about it. Um, so as it's scanning across, you can see on the left-hand panel, we're getting some shifting in the images. Um, this can result just from the um, triggering of the camera, as well as when the wind blows, the box can swing. Um, and how the image capture is currently set up is there's only about 10% overlap um, among the images. Um, for commercial software like PIX4D or Metashape that you would use for stitching uh, UAV data, typically the overlap set much higher, generally 70% or more. Um, and so this was our first big you know, hurdle is we need to be able to generate these ortho mosaics so we can look at full fields. Um, luckily for us, we have this very talented young man named Irian Azir, who is a computer scientist that really took this problem and ran with it. Um, and in his research, he developed this uh, program called Megastitch. Um, this is a new you know, algorithm that can stitch images and it, it outperforms our commercial like, software that we typically use like PIX4D. Um, additionally, it doesn't always have to rely on the uh, 
<clears throat> the amount of overlap that you have. And so the other nice thing about it is it can deal with a lot more environmental constraints. So on the right hand side, you can see for our lettuce field, you know, we have basically the breaks in the images, but you have this like inconsistent, you know, shadows. If we scale this up, um, Arizona is a really sunny place. And sometimes, you know, things happen during the scan. So on the left hand side, occasionally we do get clouds and you can see the impact that has on the images that we collect um, with respect to, you know, having plants that are in shadow. Um, and this type of imagery, uh, you know, it was hard for commercial software. On the right hand side, um, due to the design feature of the gantry itself, during the middle of the summer, it casts a shadow on the plants that it's imaging. And so you can see that's why you have these consistent dark edges at the top of each image. And so these types of challenges, you know, are make using commercial products hard. And so that's why it was so awesome to have Arian come in and kind of tackle this problem. Because for us, really, we wanted to get to the point of having, you know, these full field ortho mosaics um, so we could, you know, proceed with our analyses. And why we cared about them is really one of the ultimate goals we had is that instead of like working specifically at the plot level, we wanted to cha you know, challenge ourselves and see like, can we track each individual plant? Um, and so we had this really amazing undergraduate, Travis Simmons, who was an intern for us, um, but has now turned into our data specialist, but he was tasked with, you know, identifying and tracking 30,000 individual plants across an entire growing season. And basically, you know, he implemented a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms and the stuff that Jesse's talked about uh, specifically for this one, it was a faster RCNN network um, to do the identification of plants. And then he used this approach of a collaborative clustering to basically group these plants across time within the images. And why that was so critical is because for the first time, um, we were able to sit there and watch each one of these 30,000 individual plants grow over the course of the season. And so this short like GIF just shows you like how we were able to track these plants and really understand like the dynamics. And so when you think about this in the context of a larger season, um, you know, we're able to track the growth and get this very nice temporal resolution of how plants grow. Um, and so specifically, you know, the growth curve looks nice and it's like area, like it performs how we expect, but what's really illuminating about this and why we're excited is because now it kind of offers the potential to understand how the plants interact with the environment on a dynamic time basis. Um, so in Arizona, things can get pretty extreme. Last year, we had a stretch of like three weeks where the average temperature was 40 degrees Celsius. Um, really on the verge of what limits can, excuse me, what plants can tolerate in terms of stress. And so we're really inter interested in understanding, you know, how do plants respond? So, you know, there's other phenotypes such as things that you can measure like at a snapshot in time, things like plant height um, and heading date, as Jesse showed. But what we're, we're kind of after is like, how do plants modulate and respond to environmental constraints? Like how do they alter their growth rate, um, you know, basically what is that response to the environment look like? And so that's why we were so keen on being able to track each and every individual plant over the season is now we get a better insight into how the plants are actually responding to the environment. So this comes into uh, play when we're talking about things like quantifying canopy temperature. Um, Jesse showed, you know, canopy temperature historically has been shown to have a negative correlation with yield in most major crops. Um, and so, we had a young man named Sebastian working on this project. Um, again, you know, as Jesse talked about, we trained a neural network to identify these single heads of lettuce in a thermal image. Um, so again, we could track these same plants over time and we could see kind of how the, you know, transpiration rate via stomatal closure and water potential was changing in response to the treatments that were applied. And so on the left-hand side, you can kind of see that our well water, water limited, and severely uh, water limited, they performed how you expect. Um, lettuce was a little bit challenging because it's grown in the winter. Um, so you're not able to you know, impose as much stress as you like. Um, specifically that winter was kind of abnormally cold and wet, uh, which did not do us a lot of justice on you know, our stress trial. But uh, towards the end of the season, we we're still able to discern the patterns that we kind of uh, were expecting to see. But more importantly, you know, it's about the tool development. And so for us, um, you know, canopy temperature is a big one in Arizona. 
Um, it's where a lot of the pioneering work by like Ezo Jackson was done when uh, this was when canopy temperature was kind of like postulated as a relationship or an indirect measure of stomatal conductance. Um, and so for us, it's a very nice trait because it really does capture, you know, how plants are regulating water in response to the environment. So another sensor that is on board the gantry is a, a PS2 camera for Photosystem 2. This um, sensor is able to take an image of the plants. And basically what it's doing is it sends out a saturating pulse of light, which quenches all the photosystem. And then basically it's taking 100 images in about a second to understand how you know, the plant is able to shuttle electrons uh, through the Z scheme and basically you know, start opening up reaction centers to carry out photosynthesis. And so this is some work done by Emmanuel Gonzalez in the lab. And basically, again, we can track this type of data over the season. Um, specifically, when we're looking at you know, response to heat and drought stress. And so why this is critical is like for things like uh, PS2, you know, we can sense the stress before there's any visual symptoms. Um, we know that the, you know, photosynthesis machinery, um, photoreaction centers are highly sensitive to stress. So this gives us like an early indication of when plants are beginning to suffer. But more importantly, kind of what we're after is the idea of like sensor integration. Um, so by having, you know, PS2, which measures basically the photochemical efficiency of the plants, relating that to something like stomatal conductance, which we're capturing with our thermal imaging system, and then finally tying that together with um, things like bounding area or plant volume, we're able to get a more you know, clear picture, again, of how plants are responding at the physiological and morphological level in response to heat and drought stress. And so again, as we move forward in our project, that's kind of one of the big focuses, how do we combine these different avenues of data to really get at more of the stress biology that you know, plants are employing to deal with the stress that they're facing. Um, something that I'm kind of very interested in is this idea of plant performance prediction. Um, and so this is some work being done by a postdoc in the lab, Nathan Endler. Um, the question is like, okay, we have this like really resolved, highly, you know, temporally based data. What can we actually do with, you know, high throat phenotyping data in terms of, you know, instead of just making cool figures and graphs, like turn into like a production tool. And so Nathan said about working on using uh, our 3D data. So in the left-hand image, you can see, this is what we're able to generate with the line scanner on board the system. We get these highly resolved um, images of the plants. Um, these lettuce plants are about three inches tall. And so we're able to like track that growth rate, um, you know, volume over time. And combining that with environmental data as well as the image data that we're collecting from the RGB, um, you know, use machine learning. Specifically, we use long short-term memory networks to predict plant performance over time. And so we had these predictions, but the question was, is like, how far out from harvest can we go? Um, and specifically still have predictions that are fairly accurate. So in this case, Nathan said about uh, basically changing the prediction window. And so in this case, um, we're 30 days out from harvest on the right-hand uh, graph. And we have a prediction accuracy of, I think it was 96%. Um, and what's kind of exciting is I didn't get the best line drawn on the figure, um, but if you were to you know, have an exponential curve, the prediction would probably lie over here somewhere instead of over here. Um, and we've been seeing this a lot in the other plots that basically you know, the neural network is able to capture some type of nonlinear response. Um, over time that we wouldn't get in like a linear prediction model and account for that, which is really what's helping to drive the accuracy and predictions that we're seeing. Um, so, so this is some work that we're just beginning. Um, we're looking to obviously try this and refine it a little bit more as we integrate more sensor data. Um, another project that we're working on is being led by a grad student, Michele Kosai, and this is disease detection and quantification. Um, so, you know, plant diseases are inevitable in all production environments. So having tools to basically detect and aid management is critical. Um, you know, it allows you to shift from being reactive to a proactive management strategy. And so the one that we are kind of focused on is charcoal dry rot. In this case, it's a sorghum. Um, dry rots are caused by a species of uh, fungal um, born, soil borne disease, macrophamonia. There's about 200 species that inflect infect a wide host range. 
Um, it's prevalent in dry soils, which is again what we're thinking about as we project in the future about arid and semi-arid environments. Um, so in this case, um, a different you know, neural network approach was used in terms of a UNET structure, um, training on the images, being able to you know, accurately detect. So on the left-hand side of the bottom here, this is the hand-labeled image by a person. Um, on the right hand, excuse me, the middle image, this is what the algorithm actually detected. And then when we overlay the two to kind of get the intersection of union, basically the accuracy, um, we find out, you know, how right the algorithm was. Um, early testing, we're at like at 90%. Um, so that's pretty exciting for, you know, what we're thinking about. And so how we see this as being more of an applied tool is deploying this on a drone. So specifically having drones that have GPUs on board. Um, so as the drone's flying, it's collecting the image. The images are being processed in, uh, in real time using the developed algorithm. And then that information, so when the drone lands, basically a map's generated in a farmer could hopefully just be like, this is where I have my disease problems in the field. Um, if you talk to producers, that's their biggest reluctance to using UAV in production agriculture is just that they don't have time to fly the drone, process the data, and do all that other jazz to actually get actionable information. And so we're kind of hoping to address that problem. Um, a cool project that's just starting um, kind of follows along the same lines of, you know, in silico plant growth and development. Um, so we're helping, you know, we're helping other groups, specifically Dr. Bedrick Beans at Purdue University and James Schnabel at UNL. And this is some work funded by AG2Pi, which is the um, Animal Genomes to Phenome Initiative. Um, this is a large consortium of researchers from animal scientists, plant scientists, all working to kind of study how to kind of close the genotype to phenotype gap um, using a variety of tools. So Bedrick is a uh, computer scientist, specifically in visual media. And so you see in the image that these are plants that have been grown in silico using their algorithm. Um, and so this algorithm relies on having, you know, 3D point cloud data, which is exactly the type of data that we're able to generate with the gantry. And so we're using geometric modeling and object reconstruction to basically develop these simulated data sets of organism development. Um, this is you know, impactful because as Jesse talked about, when you're using machine learning, there's this training phase where somebody has to go through and you know, uh, label the images. And it's extremely time intensive. We've been trying to do it on point cloud data itself and it's just been brutal in terms of how long it's taking. And so by doing this in silico, as the algorithm develops a point cloud, it already has labeled the data in terms of whether this is a leaf, a stalk, a panicle, a flower. And so that greatly speeds things up. And so we're kind of you know, using this approach to understand plant growth, canopy dynamics um, in response to the environment. Um, this summer, we're deploying some sensors to basically measure how light interacts with the plant canopy and then employing a ray tracing experiment to really understand how does light filter down through a sorghum canopy and how does this relate to light use efficiency as well as biomass generation? Um, one of the other things we're working on is since we're generating all this high resolution data, um, we understand that again, not everybody can come to Arizona, um, but we still want people to be able to like use our data, interact with it and study it. And so a lot of this high phenotyping data, you know, people want it to be reduced down to you know, an Excel spreadsheet that just has like a table of values that I can put into R but part of the whole thing, you know, the exciting about data analysis is like data, you know, expo exploratory analyses. And so we've been working on this like virtual environment where you can see that this is just one row of plants from the field, but um, with VR, you know, you can walk up, you can click on the plant with your hands, it pulls up all this associated phenomic data. So, you know, you can get like the scan dates, bounding area over time, so how the plant's growing. Down here, you can actually you know, pull out that 3D point cloud of the plant, interact with it. Because um, as Jesse talked about, the, the breeder or people have like an intuitive sense um, for plants, for plant performance, the traits that you know, they think are important. And so this creates like an environment for people to really like go in there and explore the plants without having to physically be um, in Arizona. Um, and so when we think about that, from the context of like, you know, collaborations that, you know, somebody like Rod could come to the virtual field at Maricopa and still walk through it with the VR glasses and, you know, basically get a similar experience as of those being um, there in person. 
And then finally, some stuff that um, I'm kind of excited about. Um, there's some newly funded research about implementing ecophysiological modeling to study complex traits. Um, so when we think about the, the actual plant processes and physiology that gives rise to, to stress adaptive traits, it's a lot of complex things going on within the plant. And these traditionally have been really traits that are hard to measure. Um, so in this case, the one that we're after is hydraulic conductance. And this is basically how well the xylem structure is able to transport water from the soil profile up to the canopy. Um, and so we're using this model called trees. It's one of the few models that actually can uh, capture plant hydraulics in relation to carbon allocation. So reproductive structures versus vegetative structures. Um, this is a fairly complex model, like heat uh, mass transfer model um, that takes in a lot of environmental drivers. So you can see on the right hand side, things like soil weather, soil water data. Um, and then, you know, using our high throat phenotyping data like leaf area, plant height, canopy temperature, we can feed this, feed this information into the model to extract out parameters such as hydraulic conductance, which is a trait that we would never be able to measure at large scale. Um, right now, it takes about a day to measure hydraulic conductance on about three plants. Um, so there's no way we'd ever be able to do that at the population level. And so this is an exciting project for myself because it's kind of an integration of, you know, physiology, high throat phenotyping, um, the modeling component to really get at what is driving the plant response versus just the things that we can measure. Um, I think that's kind of maybe one of the new shifts as we go forward is um, trying to get more at the processes that give rise to the phenotypes instead of the phenotypes themselves. Um, so I just want to you know, conclude briefly that our lab is using a lot of variety of tools to look at stress adaptive traits of crop plants, um, you know, leveraging data science, machine learning, AI to process um, these large volumes of data is just becoming hypercritical um, in any research group. Um, I like to say the field scanner is finally becoming like a research grade instrument. Um, you know, there was numerous challenges from the get go itself, uh, from the actual structure to the cameras. Um, but certainly, you know, recently in the last year with the help of Eric, like getting this pipeline up and running to process data. I mean, it's just so exciting to get having to go from like waiting six months to get any type of data back to, you know, a day and a half. And then to get a Slack message makes it even better. Um, so we're generating these high spatial temporal uh, data sets to investigate heat and drought response. So how do, like, what are the dynamics of plant response? Because um, that's really, I guess, the key is not just measuring the phenotype itself, but how the plant's changing. Um, and so we're developing a lot of these new tools um, that are free, open source. And then finally, you know, employing modeling to, to study complex phenotypes that we aren't able to measure directly. Um, I think this is kind of one area that we'll see phenomics really have an impact on in the future. Um, so I did just want to thank everybody for your time. Um, hopefully I left a left, excuse me, I left enough for some questions. Um, but just to conclude that the data from this project is open source. Uh, we, it's publicly available. We'd love it if you'd use it or are interested in it. Um, again, the pipeline is open source and it can be used for processing UAV imagery. Um, on UAV stuff, it's even faster um, because we do realize that not everybody has a gantry. Um, and so we're the only ones that do. So perhaps that's not of immense value. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everybody for their time and hopefully Rod, we still have enough time for questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Great, uh, cool stuff you're doing. Wow. So let's get Jesse back on and get his get his picture. And I'm just going to open the floor up. Okay. I mean, uh, excellent, pretty cool stuff uh, you guys are working on. It's uh, absolutely uh, remarkable and uh, two different angles. So so I will never call you a, pr a plant breeder again, Duke. Sorry about that. Well, maybe one day. <laughs> It takes a little bit of time. So uh, let's, uh, is, any questions, anybody? Don't be shy. Okay, talk's over. <laughs> no, so uh, I, I just had a question. Uh, I had a question for, for Jesse. Um, you know, you got the ons versus no ons, that imaging system. Will there be a time when you can take a, uh, uh, a, you know, a UAV and just, and just like, you know, fly over a, 
you know, I don't know, uh, like a forest and, and be able to figure out what's growing and, you know, what, what everything is growing in that, in that area. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think they're there. I mean, there's groups working on like tree identification from leaf shape and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, in that specific example, I think it's totally tractable because you can identify what species of tree you could, you know, with that level of resolution, you could, yeah, you could do something crazy like that. You know, for, you know, like, like invasive species, I'm thinking of yeah. buffalo grass, Arizona, you know, you could just, you know, UAVs and just identify that and just, na and just take a laser and blow them out. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, know. If you know can do that. Yeah. I don't know about the laser yet. Yeah, so I don't know about zapping them would be pretty hard. Yeah. That's the next, that's the next thing to get on there. So it's a, I remember seeing a, um, in, in Maricopa, in, in Yuma, there was a, a, a device that would go through and it would actually be, they wanted the spacing. And if the spacing wasn't right, they had a little thing that would kill the, kill the plant. Yeah, that lettuce bot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, so don't, don't uh, I don't want to be the only person with a question. I see Hanan's got her. No, you're not, Rod. Rod, there's two hands up. Okay. Hanin and Yossin. Okay, well, um, you guys go ahead and ask live. I'm not going to read your questions, okay? Please just, just speak up. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this nice talk. Um, so it's always actually fascinating uh, when the uh, topics comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning. I think really artificial intelligence will take over us. <laughs> so uh, I have like just maybe two uh, points for discussion. And this is general, it's not specific for Jesse or Duke. Is that, um, is it like this deep uh, learning or machine learning uh, to do uh, high throughput phen phenotyping uh, affected by uh, uh, the plants? If the plants, for example, is loading, uh, it has small grains and spikes, like is the performance of deep learning models uh, can be uh, reduced. And uh, another uh, point is um, if it's possible that this uh, technology combining, of course, with genotyping and maybe uh, with environmental factors can be used to identify varieties that will be suitable in future conditions. So taking in, a, in account that uh, there will be uh, more climate change in the future and so on. So can we predict the crop performance in the future with these technologies? Um, I guess, Jesse, uh, my answer to the first part is the question you're asking about the machine learning. Um, really, it comes down to how much time and energy you invest in the, the training data set. Um, you know, I think that's where you spend all your upfront time. And that's kind of what limits you in terms of what your algorithm can do. Um, I'm sure Jesse has something to add. For the second one about predicting plant performance, um, yes, I think that's exactly what we're kind of working towards. So that model trees, um, we were able to predict plant performance in Texas, um, just using environmental data that they had. And, you know, as long as, you know, you're only as good as your model. So, you know, making sure you're not extrapolating from your data, but interpolating, um, I think that's kind of the limit. But yes, I think in the future, um, if you have a good enough data set that you would have that possibility. Yep, I agree. I think Duke's right on there. Thank you, thank you so much. Next question from uh, uh, Yaselin. Yes. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you so much for these uh, talks. Are very enriching and quite related to my research interest. So it's fascinating to to read to hear about this. So I have two questions uh, or a couple of questions for both of, of you. Um, for Dr. Jesse, um, I would like to know which criteria do you follow to choose um, the deep learning uh, classification model that you are using? I mean, because there is a lot of classifications models or deep learning models out there. So which criteria do you follow to each uh, convolutional network, for instance? And the second question is um, also about the criteria that you follow to choose um, 
which relevant traits do you um, you have to phenotype? Because what happens sometimes is that we want to collect a lot of data. We want to uh, pheno we want to um, collect different traits at the same time, but maybe maybe not all of them are um, relevant for the specific purpose that we have. Yes. So which criteria to follow to collect the the relevant ones? And for Dr. Duke, I have one question, and is how to put together all these digital-based HTTP uh, traits and environmental uh, param parameters into a um, modeling framework. Because I think when we put together these two uh, kinds of uh, inputs or parameters, we can really uh, uh, be closer to connect phenotyping to uh, genotyping. Yeah, great, great question. I'll go on. I mean, uh, first one, thinking about like what network or what model to use, I don't know. You just ask your computer science friends. Um, I mean, these guys, I mean, these guys are, you know, there's something new coming every day. And so I think some of these, you know, they even called some of our, you know, like Robert Pless and these guys who work, they call these kind of vanilla models. They're really basic models in some sense i think that and in my mind what i've seen too and this same thing with genomics data sets the same the thing that you know if the the better the training data and the better the data set you have going into it it makes the whole modeling so much easier and so um, a lot of times you can spend a lot of fancy modeling on lousy data sets and still not you know make make much of an improvement um, and then on the, you know, on what traits to focus on, right? Like on on list is not, not really a very important trait at all. But it was, that was more of a testing case, something that was easy and very tractable to do. Heading date and relative maturity, those are obviously very important ones. So it's, yeah, so you can spend a lot of time going after like irrelevant um, phenotypes just because they're tractable to do for like high throughput phenotyping. Um, and so I think you really got to balance like what's actually going to be relevant for making selection decisions or breeding or genetics versus like what's just an interesting engineering experiment. Yeah, that'd be my thoughts. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, regarding the second one, how do you put all this stuff together? That's a challenge, um, right? Each sensor outputs a ton of data across different days and we're struggling with how to combine all that. Um, kind of like Jesse said, this is when you go talk to your computer science friends um, because, you know, you can't keep up on all this stuff as well as doing science. And so we're taking a new approach um, where basically each sensor is its own, you know, flat file. And we have like a new algorithm to basically integrate all those flat files into one thing because um, what I'm specifically interested in, again, is how understanding those like environmental dynamics drive the phenotype. And so that is kind of the challenge is how do we push all that together. And I don't have a good answer for you right now, other than saying that you're right. It's a huge challenge and I think we're all working on it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Duke. Thanks, Jesse. Um, uh, another question from uh, Ikram. Neat. Hi guys, really great talk, both uh, Duke and, and Jesse, very fantastic uh, deep learning AI. So this is the future and not only for breeding, but also for cell biology and all, I mean, you have shown the neuron and then the networks and we also do the same for monitoring cells uh, changes at the cellular re uh, resolution. So my question is mainly to Duke concerning the, the, the stitching that you do when you are, uh, um, uh, screen in your field, which is something similar that what we do when you are scanning a large field of view. So does it work by, uh, I just want by curiosity to know whether it works by having an overlap between images and then stacking them how, or, or, or it's something different? Um, it's a little bit something different. So because the overlap between the images is pretty minimal, um, it does use like feature, uh, basically like in the commercial software, like the tie points, um, those features that are similar amongst images. Um, it does use that and rely on it. Um, I think it's just, I don't know the entire specifics. Um, I'm not the computer scientist. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, yeah, it's using a similar approach, but the algorithm that it's employing is a little bit more complex in terms of the criteria it's using to identify and match those points across images. Additionally, computationally, it's faster, so it can try out more of those combinations and say like PIX40 or Agisoft. Um, I think that's why one of the reasons, um, and it does still kind of rely, rely on um, the actual like geo, georeference data for the image like when it was collected. So it has a vague idea of like, oh, this picture is approximately here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not totally, the field isn't stitched title totally naively. And you get it in one go or you have to run several times before having the whole study? Uh, no, it, it, can go, it, it runs in one go. Okay. Dependent on the lacquer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, for Jesse, uh, your deep learning is, is, is really fantastic, but how... Um, uh, so do you know whether you, you are missing, uh, missing some traits because you go high throughput and then you are using drone, which are not, uh, that's uh, always the same thing that I have with Matt. So the, the, the distance, I mean, your drone cannot really go very um, close to your samples, right? So I don't know how high in resolution do you go? Yeah, maybe I, maybe I missed that. We, we fly these quite low actually five or six okay. meters. Um, and with that zoom lens on there, yeah, you can get like millimeter pixel resolution. So okay. it's not as high as the gantry, but it's it's like still high enough that, you know, we can see those ons and those really fine features. Okay, cool, cool. Thanks. Okay, um, uh, thanks Ikram. Uh, Paul, Paul Brierley, from, uh, are you in Yuma? I am in Yuma. Thanks. Okay. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Good presentations, guys. Um, I just wanted to ask Duke, you know, uh, you talked some about uh, getting UAV images from elsewhere and, and being able to utilize some of these tools. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, what you give up, um, how that would work, what, what you can learn if you do some of the phenotyping uh, somewhere else using UAVs rather than with the scanalyzer. Sure. So, you know, the, the tools and stuff that are being developed, um, we have the ability with the gantry data to downsample it. So we can mimic the resolution that you would get from like a UAV. Um, but specifically, I think, you know, the approaches and the pipeline that we have, it works on UAV data. So, you know, Paul, the, the data that you guys are collecting in Yuma, like if you have like the GCP locations and like the shape files and stuff, like we can process that. There isn't, I wouldn't say there's a huge detriment to the data, the data quality that could be delivered. Um, you know, and if you're talking more specifically about the resolution of the images in terms of what can be gained and uh, from having high resolution, is that more of a question or? Well, the resolution's one, I guess, and just the types of sensors that, that can be put on a UAV versus what's in the, the scanalyzer. Sure. Um, so obviously, you know, the weight's a big thing with what can be put on a drone. Um, although that's quickly changing, um, I had purchased one of those spray drones, so it carries 35 pounds. Um, so that opens up the possibility of like larger payloads, like a hyperspectral camera. Um, but for the most part, the trade-off is that resolution um, when we think about sensors other than RGB. Um, so that is something that has to be considered. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Jesse says he has to uh, leave, but we do have one more question um, from Giovanni. Um, I don't, if, if Giovanni, get on quickly. And uh... I, yeah, so uh, well, I will be quick. Uh, well, uh, it's a question for both. It's about uh, physiological traits that I think are the one that probably are difficult to be scored by breeders because it's not just a visual as a assessment of, of something. It's something that you need like more sophisticated instrument to measure. So uh, how far we are from uh, integrating physiological traits into breeding program, for example, considering canopy temperature, that is probably the one that can be also determined by drones instead of the, the, the gantry that it's something that of course it's difficult to apply for for normal breeding programs around the world but drones can be used for that so yeah that's uh, that's the question do you know if it's like breeding programs are already using canopy temperature for example for uh, for uh, like improving plants for drought yeah good question I'll, I'll speak some to like the cement and some wheat breeding programs it's it's been used for quite some time 
um, kind of in a lower throughput, you know, like taking hand measurements. And so it's, a, yeah, you're right. It's a really nice physiological tool for as like, you know, a piece of information that the breeder takes in for selecting something that would be drought or heat tolerant. And so I think, like I was trying to explain, you know, this next generation of prediction models is we're just now at the point where we can collect all of these secondary traits, high throughput on the full populations. And so the next question really is on this physiological modeling selection decisions. How do you actually utilize, best utilize all of that, you know, measurements and data? Okay, thanks. Okay. I, I just have a I, I have a question for for uh, Duke. How long is your uh, how far is your uh, the gantry system booked out? And would you build another one? Uh, <laughs> That's a loaded question. Very. Would I build another one? Um, I'm not so sure. I think there's other platforms that can probably achieve similar stuff, and especially as sensor technology gets smaller, better. Um, I'm not sure the gantry would be the tool of choice. Um, it's a it's a pretty pretty big hammer. Uh, so you really got to have that nail. But um, yeah, I guess that's how I answer that, Rod. In terms of booking, um, good question. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> no, I mean I mean I've I've always been thinking that the the gantry system, you know, it basically gives you ref, reference grade phenotypes. It definitely you know, does. That, that's um, kind of how I describe that. And it, I think there's, there is some value to that. Definitely. And I, you know, but as Jesse points out, I think the one limitation that we suffer from and always will is it's a small sample size. Um, okay. Okay. There's only so much I can do in an acre, right? And Jesse's got hundreds of acres and um, it's really, it's a, and that's why I say like gantry is probably best suited as a primary research question tool. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I would like to develop the models and give them to Jesse, and then he can do the real work since he's the breeder. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, any 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 closing remarks? I mean, this has been a this uh, our first seminar uh, joint seminar, and I'm very excited about it. I think it went went well. We had a good turnout and uh, two great talks. The next um, week it's going to be uh, Mark Tester and Marat. Casera uh, uh, in uh, on kind of control environmental agriculture theme, so it should be pretty exciting. So um, uh, I'll just uh, w close and say thank you very much, and uh, uh, welcome you all next uh, next Tuesday. We're going to do this for six weeks, uh, seven weeks, and uh, hopefully we can continue a, a long term collaboration uh, with uh, amongst us and get some good discussions going. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, good to see you all. So, uh, thanks. Take Ryan. care and have a good rest of your day. <laughs> We're going to bed. <laughs> see you.